at this lecture, which would be given by Professor Tryan Dumitrika, who is associate professor of mechanical engineering uh, of that type, but uh, Tryan also has close connection with our department. He's an a graduate faculty member for our department as well as for a number of other departments like uh, chemical engineering and material science, physics and scientific computing. He also co-advised uh, some of our students in the past, and some of them are graduates. You could see it on that slide. Uh, Tryon um, uh, research interests are in the area of uh, modeling and simulation of materials, and uh, his topics include nanomechanics, electronic and heat transport, and nanoscale development of distinct finite element method. We just heard a discussion about that. And the symmetry adapted atomistic scale computation and also coherent response of matter to light. And with that, please join me in welcoming Tryon to our department. Well, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you, Sonia, for inviting me. And thank you very much for uh, coming. So. Uh, um, as uh, Sonia mentioned, I uh, I am uh, uh, I benefit from an uh, 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 courtesy appointment here from uh, an, in uh, civil engineering, and uh, one of the students that uh, uh, you see here, Igor Ostani, uh, graduated his uh, PhD with me in uh, uh, collaboration with uh, Professor Roberto Ballerini, that was at the time uh, here as well. Uh, and uh, he worked exactly on uh, the topic uh, of today's talk, uh, this uh, mesoscopic distinct uh, element uh, uh, method, uh, which in time evolved towards a method uh, toar, uh, that is able to computationally guide structural nanomaterial design. Uh, and uh, what I would like to talk uh, about today is the applications of uh, the method in modeling the mechanics of carbon nanotube uh, system. Uh, so for a long time before uh, actually coming here and maybe uh, continuing a little bit in my uh, early years here at the University of Minnesota, I was working on the mechanics of individual carbon uh, nanotubes. So I'll briefly review our main results to give you an idea about how uh, this uh, structure look like and how they uh, fail uh, under uh, stretching uh, deformation. Um, and uh, then uh, in the uh, second part of my talk, I'll be talking about using uh, the distinct element method at the mesoscale as a coarse grain method uh, to predict the mechanics of ensemble of such carbon nanotube uh, system. Uh, and uh, essentially this came up as a new uh, method, uh, missing method that, uh, a method that was needed for modeling the mesoscale mechanics of uh, this structure. And uh, we uh, hope that this structure, this method, the resulting method will be useful for uh, guiding the uh, design of uh, super strong lightweight uh, composite materials based <coughs> on carbon nanotubes. Um, so uh, as you probably saw in this uh, uh, first uh, slide, the work was fund is funded by uh, NASA. Uh, so they are very interested in using this method uh, to help them achieve uh, a composite carbon nanotube mat material that is uh, over uh, super light and super strong uh, competing and uh, surpassing the carbon nanotube fibers, which is the current uh, state of the art in uh, materials for uh, aerospace uh, structure application. So uh, this is just an initial slide for those who are not familiar with carbon nanotubes. So uh, essentially these are just roll-up graphene uh, sheets. Uh, so uh, the, uh, we are just taking a graphene sheet. Here you see here the carbon atoms are here at the corners. and. Uh, you have this honeycomb lattice, we roll this up. Uh, diameter here, it's about on the order of nanometers in the early uh, days. So this is more like materials from Rice University kind of that started to, to, to be developed in the, in the 90s and 2000s. So the diameter here would be on order of uh, one nanometer uh, and length could be 
uh, micrometers or uh, even uh, meters. So they are uh, cylindrical small diameter. Uh, the wrapping could happen under different uh, chiralities. So we would have, uh, so if this is the circumference vector, right? So this uh, essentially would be the diameter of the tube. We can uh, have the diameter in, on the different directions. So we are introducing this chirality. And uh, typically tubes are uh, labeled by these indexes N and M. Uh, which essentially are the components of the circumference vector on the two lattice vectors of the lattice. So we would have uh, not only diameter as an important uh, uh, factor here, but also the chirality. Um, and then you can see here, for example, tubes that have uh, this chirality angle 30 degrees, so you have bonds that are along the circumference. Uh, chirality angle is zero here, so you have bonds that are along the tube axis or some other uh, random chirality, right? So the three non, I, non uh, three different bonds are now having different angles with the axis direction, uh, tube axis direction. Uh, and he here to your right, you see this uh, raw produced carbon nanotubes. Again, this is an old picture from the uh, 90s, 2000. Uh, and uh, what you see here is an entangled structure which uh, is called Bucky paper. So we have uh, single wall carbon nanotubes that are uh, uh, en entangled and they are bent. And uh, the, uh, so they, they, surprisingly, they look uh, like uh, cooked spaghetti instead of like uncooked spaghetti, uh, considering the fact that they are very strong uh, and stiff structure. And the reason for this bending deformation is uh, that uh, uh, they, they do bend because of the long range interaction with each other. Okay, so they have, a dr the Van der Waals interactions are an important force here. Uh, they uh, drive this, uh, the organization of this mat into uh, this, uh, into bundles. So tubes are organized in bundles and then they also uh, band. So we have uh, strain energy stored uh, there. We have Van der Waals energy uh, as well. Um, so uh, I have to say that in the more recently, uh, there has been a more uh, significant progress in producing uh, carbon nanotube materials on a larger industrial uh, scale. Uh, the structures that are produced now uh, by a company called Nanocomp, which actually was purchased by another <laughs> company, uh, Hansmann, uh, recently, uh, uh, comprises uh, uh, more, uh, more often multi-wall carbon nanotubes uh, of somewhat larger diameter. So uh, we are moving from one diameter to uh, 10, uh, nanotube, uh, 10, 10 nanometer in diameter and multiple walls, so concentric walls. Uh, so it is uh, still a carbon nanotube type of material, they are adopting maybe another uh, <laughs> nomenclature now, they call it uh, Miralon, so if you want to buy it, they call it actually Miralon, not Bucky paper, probably for commercial reasons, but really it's the same uh, structure, the, sa the same material, but with just different uh, structural uh, feature. Uh, so in the first time, part, I want to talk about, okay, uh, this structure, uh, about the mechanics of individual tubes. So here we are uh, uh, trying to understand uh, how do the structure fails if we are applying uh, uh, stretching uh, deformation, like in this uh, early experiment uh, here. So you see here a carbon nanotube, a single wall one, hanging uh, and clamped between the tips of an atomic force microscope uh, tips, and it is uh, stretched, and then at some point it breaks somewhere uh, in, the, in the middle. So we're trying to understand how this, this structure uh, fails. Uh, at the atomistic level. So here we need discrete uh, type of description to model this, but the, disc the discrete should be atomistic uh, type of description. So uh, at the time when I uh, started working on this subject, uh, this was considered as a plausible possibility. So this is the so-called Stonewall's transformation in, in a carbon nanotube uh, wall. So you see here somewhere, uh, let's say, imagine somewhere on the structure you have these four carbon, uh, four hexagonal carbon rings, and then uh, let's say the applied strain is around 
this direction. So this bond that you see here rotates by uh, 90 degrees, uh, all right, and then transform this four uh, hexagon into pentagon, pentagon, heptagon, heptagon. So this is a uh, defect uh, in, 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 in the uh, hexagonal uh, wall now. Uh, so uh, it's called a stonewall's transformation. You can also think of this as a, a dislocation uh, dipole, okay, more in mechanical uh, terms. So if you s look here uh, at the graphene sheet and if we are taking out uh, this covered uh, zigzag rows of carbon and put the structures together, right, we are forming here the five, seven ring and then everything else is uh, six. So if you form two of those, you have this uh, uh, six, uh, seven, uh, five, seven, uh, five, seven uh, dipole forming uh, there. So uh, why is this in interesting in the context of uh, mechanical uh, deformation? Uh, so the idea is that, okay, if, if, if this is the applied strain direction and this is rotated by 90 degrees, uh, forming this, uh, this defect, the structure elongates along this uh, bond direction, about the bonds that rotate direction. So the structure being elongated, it relieves this applied strain. Um, and uh, I think there were some pictures here, but oops. Yeah, for some reason there was a picture here, but uh, okay, <laughs> with this transfer is missing, but that's okay. Uh, so this is an energetically favorable defect under uh, deformation. Uh, so the structure containing the defect under stretching becomes energetically more favorable than the perfect one. When this bond is oriented uh, um, in the uh, predominantly axial uh, direction. So right, so if I rotate maybe uh, this bond by 90 degrees, this strain will not be relieved as much and uh, then this would not be such a favorable uh, transformation. Uh, so however, uh, so that means that in the thermodynamic limit, so if, if, if this uh, probing, mechanical probing would happen very slow, uh, there will be uh, time, enough time to, for this <coughs> transformation to happen and then this will be a yield event. Um, However, uh, to, uh, um, to perform this bond rotation, it takes a lot of, um, uh, it takes a lot of energy. So one has to jump over some barrier. So this graph that you see here, so this is a quantum mechanical uh, calculation showing the energetic landscape as we rotate this bond by 90 degrees. So this would be the perfect state, and then we are starting to rotate the bond, right? So the angle here is uh, zero, and then this is 90 degrees. This would be the final state. So this would be a metastable state. So the formation energy of the defect is 3 EV, which is a low, low, uh, low energy defect, right? Uh, but to, to reach here, one has to climb over this mountain, and the energy here is very large, about nine electron volts. So this is uh, if you are not very familiar with this scale, this is a very huge, it's a very large barrier. So really to, to jump over this, you need, uh, using some sort of Arrhenius type uh, prediction, you need to wait uh, perhaps the age of the universe uh, time. So it's something that will not really happen at room temperature at least. If we are stretching this, if we are stretching the structure, this barrier, it's lower according uh, to this calculation. So we are approaching uh, maybe three electron volts, so this is at 12 EV. So this transformation becomes possible, but it's still not, it's a rare, it's what uh, people call a rare event. So it's something that happens maybe rarely. Okay, so and you need of course temperature to, to jump over this uh, barrier. Uh, therefore we considered the alternative fracture uh, process at the atomistic scale, which uh, uh, essentially it's a non-thermal uh, process because fracture happens without the, can happen without the aid of, of uh, temperature. So one process would be thermal, uh, the stone wall is one, and the second one would be uh, fracture. So we will be looking when this fracture would happen. So here we study with, again, with quantum methods, uh, 
uh, how a fracture develops in uh, carbon nanotubes. So these are these zigzag tubes where uh, you have bonds along the uh, axial uh, direction. So around 16% stretching, we find that uh, essentially uh, bonds are breaking and uh, we identify a set of bond breaking uh, st crack states, B1, B2, B3 here with two, three uh, broken bonds, uh, at which the electronic charge is uh, missing uh, as you see here. So uh, uh, what you see here is the electronic charge, the electronic charge cloud, and it's actually is, is very strong here when you have a, long, uh, a, a large stretching, right? The electrons are preferred to, to move from uh, between bonds, uh, between these carbon bonds to make these other bonds uh, stronger. So we are forming this, uh, uh, what is known as uh, trap states in, in uh, mechanics. Uh, so here is a picture of how these uh, trap states arise under uh, strain. So these are the uh, B equal one state, so when one bond broke, uh, B equal uh, two, three, and, and so on. So the, uh, what we find is that uh, these trap states basically do not exist over uh, a large uh, strain range. So the, for example, this B equal one bond really exists over a very narrow strain range. Uh, but this range increases with the number of bonds that are uh, cracked, and uh, the slope of these curves, the energy curves of the state with the strain, it's essentially larger for uh, larger cracks. So uh, this allows for some nice interpretation of, of this failure of failure mechanism of, of carbon nanotube under strain. So by the time uh, uh, this uh, B equal one bond uh, uh, becomes favorable, crack state becomes favorable, all these others are possible, they are lower in energy. So the lattice can energetically slide towards the low energy state and per, uh, proceed towards uh, failure. So uh, this happens around 16% as you see here in this uh, strain range. And uh, what you see to the right here is a picture of how this uh, strain range at which the carbon atom breaks depends on the chirality uh, angle. So tubes that are um, um, uh, zigzag tubes, so these uh, tubes that they have bonds along the strain direction, uh, fail earlier than the uh, armchair ones, the ones that they have bonds that are oriented perpendicularly on the, along the circumference of the tube. So uh, what we see atomistically is that this uh, breaking uh, strain range really depends on the uh, chirality uh, as well here, strongly on chirality. So uh, now we have at least two failure mechanisms here. So one, it's uh, non-thermal, the fr uh, fracture one, and one is the uh, thermal one, right, so one has to jump over these barriers in order to, to happen, a plastic uh, type of mechanism. Um, these barriers are, are still high, so atomistic methods like molecular dynamics are still not uh, great for looking at this uh, mechanism, so basically comparing these two. So therefore we use some uh, probabilistic Arrhenius approach to predict the probability to jump over uh, this barrier. So what you see here is temperature. As I mentioned, this is a thermal process. This is the size of the barrier that uh, uh, depends on chirality and uh, applied strain. And uh, this is a factor that uh, involves the uh, number of bonds, uh, the uh, transition uh, um, probability uh, of, of each bond, and this is the time uh, which is related with the st apply strain rate in the, in the structure. So by demanding that this is one, we can find the strain at which this tonalized transformation would happen, okay? And then we can compare uh, how does this look like with the uh, uh, fracture strain, which can be directly simulated by by uh, atomistic simulation because this is something that can be, uh, it's a non-thermal process, so it's, it's uh, fine to, to do it. Um, so what I have next is, okay, um, 
All right. So this is just a calculation, atomistic calculation, showing the size of this transition barrier for the Stonewalls effect as a function of applied strain and uh, chirality angle. So this depends on the uh, chirality, okay, as well. So uh, putting this together should show. Uh, uh, this is again atomistic uh, um, type of uh, calculation of the transition. Uh, Bayer. So putting all this together, we can have a map of the individual, how the individual carbon nanotube would uh, fail as a function of temperature and uh, chirality uh, angle. So uh, how, the, how do I read this, this map? So essentially, uh, this is strain, right? And this is the chirality uh, angle. And uh, these curves that you see here are the curves that are uh, predicted for the uh, plastic, the stoneless plastic uh, event to, to happen. So you see that depends on, on time, very uh, uh, weakly on, on time, depends on, on temperature. Um, and so it, this curve essentially shifts uh, and depends strongly on, on chirality because the transition barriers are a function of chirality as well. So what we see here is that uh, for zigzag tubes, we will have for sure, uh, as within this theory, we'll have bone breaking uh, fracture, okay? For um, the near uh, armchair ones, uh, we will have a plastic, an incipient plastic uh, behavior, um, even at uh, room uh, temperature happening uh, first. So this is complex, but it's, and it's only one tube, okay? We want to move now to, <laughs> to ensembles of carbon nanotubes. If we want to do uh, atomistic simulations, uh, okay, actually this is work that was maybe completed in 2006, so 12 years from then, uh, still we cannot do uh, atomistic simulations for carbon nanotube ensembles to understand their mechanics. Uh, so, uh, uh, that's why we, uh, we uh, around 2013, we started to look at mesoscale uh, methods and we learned at the time about the uh, distinct element method that was developed here in, uh, in, uh, in this department. And uh, we look at can we use the mesoscopic, uh, can we use distinct element method at the mesoscale uh, to model ensembles of uh, such carbon nanotubes to solve essentially this, this problem. Uh, so what we want to do is essentially to develop a distinct element representation of uh, carbon nanotube material, um, the kind of one that you see uh, here. So this is a carbon, uh, a CM image of a carbon nanotube yarn surface showing uh, <coughs> uh, this uh, larger diameter carbon nanotube in fact align um, and we want to essentially represent every carbon nanotube here or, or make a distinct element method comprising any carbon nanotube here represented by a chain of discrete element. We like to, uh, um, every, every cylinder that is in this chain of, of carbon nanotubes of an individual carbon nanotube should essentially correspond to a, a group of atoms in uh, in, in the structure. So we are using this as, we plan to use this as a coarse grained uh, method, okay, where we have this direct connection. So the hard task is, uh, all right, how do we develop uh, the contact uh, models to apply this to this type of uh, structure? Uh, the advantage is that there are codes around like uh, the PFC that we are using uh, intensely uh, and uh, we, uh, we also look at maybe uh, working with codes like uh, Walbera that are, distinct element codes like Walbera that are uh, suitable for um, uh, distributed memory type of high performance uh, computation uh, to, to achieve this, uh, 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 this goal. So um, I'll show a little bit how we are developing this contact uh, model. So for um, the discretis, uh, um, what, what we want to do here is to have a computational efficiency. So we want to lump a large number of carbon atoms 
into a rigid uh, distinct uh, element of cylindrical shape as you see here. Um, <coughs> so this is an example where we are coarse graining or what uh, is better said ultra coarse graining. So coarse graining typically these days means uh, maybe you are representing by a super atom, two to three, four, five atoms. Here we are on doing on the order of 100 atoms uh, lump into these uh, distinct elements. Uh, so we are evolving these uh, cylindrical, cylindrical elements in time uh, under the action of uh, forces and uh, moments. Uh, and this is some example uh, of uh, time evolution algorithm. So everything is uh, deterministic here. Uh, everything is in place, we have to just uh, develop these contact uh, models to represent uh, this time the interactions that are occurring at the uh, mesoscale, which are uh, essentially representing the underlying uh, covalent and van der Waals uh, interactions occurring in the structure. Uh, so uh, we are using uh, two types of bonds uh, that are simultaneously uh, acting uh, and uh, one of the bond is the parallel bond contact uh, occurring at the interface here between uh, two cylindrical elements representing uh, part of the uh, same uh, carbon nanotube. So uh, um, these elements essentially are uh, parameterized by uh, atomistic simulation. So we are finding this, this constants K and Ks, the distributed stretching and shear from atomistic simulations. And uh, then we are predicting here the forces and moments that uh, uh, are uh, resisting forces and moments that are arising in the uh, on the relative displacement of these two elements. So this way we can uh, capture a lot. We can capture stretching, compression, uh, twisting, uh, bending deformation, everything that is needed, at least in the uh, linear regime. So this is essentially a solved problem. Uh, the only task here was to find this KNKS based on atomistic simulation, which is not a very demanding stuff, uh, task. Uh, more challenging was to develop uh, this long-range van der Waals interaction between uh, elements. So two elements that are located on different tubes are interacting by uh, van der Waals uh, interaction. Um, and um, what we are using here is a potential that depends not only on the center-to-center -center distance uh, between uh, elements, but also on uh, this misalignment and crossing uh, angles, okay? Uh, and uh, um, as a result, we are having forces, aligning forces uh, and attraction forces and uh, moments when tubes are uh, cross and uh, misaligned. How to find this? You Again, we are matching, we are trying to match the atomistic landscape here, the atomistic interaction. And uh, I'm not going to go exactly to the analytical form of this potential uh, because uh, it's just uh, cumbersome. But uh, the key here is like, um, OK, we have this long range interaction that are uh, at the atomistic scale depending only on uh, distance, only on, on R. If we would use such type of uh, analytical form at the mesoscale, we would have a problem because um, as, we are, as we are sliding these elements against each other with an interaction potential that depends only on R, we are developing some artifacts here. Uh, the sliding should be smooth at the atomistic scale. But then we are having these artifacts. Uh, so essentially when the, the elements are staggered, always the interaction is lower, okay, if, if this form is like that. So we are, try, we are correcting uh, this type of, uh, this artifact by including uh, the theta dependence, the misalignment dependence uh, here. So as a result, the potential now it's uh, smooth, okay? So the sliding is smooth as it happens at the atomistic uh, scale. So that's, that's the key element here. So here's just an example basically showing that indeed this works. So if we have two tubes that are misaligned, they are sliding smoothly, okay? Uh, they prefer to be aligned to maximize the van der Waals attraction energy. 
with this wouldn't happen with, uh, any, uh, with the potential that would be isotropic. And here is showing that if we have tubes that are crossed, the aligning moments, they do their job and they are aligning the, the tubes. Okay. Um, so this, this works. Uh, there is something missing. Uh, so we have van der Waals, we have uh, individual mechanics of carbon ion tube. We need to have dissipation. So this is a more subtle uh, point, uh, dissipation in the system. So uh, the uh, uh, machinery of uh, PFC uh, has some numerical dissipation. Uh, essentially to uh, stabilize the time evolution algorithm. So some uh, forces and moments are added proportional with the uh, velocities and angular velocity of, of the elements. Uh, but uh, that proved, to be, uh, that proved to, to be introducing some sort of viscous friction, which is very, between two, which is very small. And in fact, this is insufficient to explain the uh, mechanics of large scale systems. Uh, so therefore, we, we are adding an additional contact dissipation element here between elements that are face to face, which is proportional with, introduces a, a sticking force proportional with the relative uh, velocity. So we have this additional constant gamma, uh, which capture this uh, stickiness, this uh, dissipation in the structure. So how do we find this gamma? Again, this gamma can be found by atomistic simulation. So we can move now to the lower scale and, uh, and look at gamma. So uh, this is, we go back to the atomistic simulations now. So we have two carbon nanotubes. Uh, so we are essentially dragging this top one against the carbon nanotube that's in on the bottom. Uh, these are periodic boundary conditions. So there are no surfaces uh, when we are doing this sliding. Uh, and we are just measuring the friction force as a function of the velocity. So we are, this is uh, VR, the relative velocity between uh, the two elements. And uh, what we find is that uh, this is the atomistic data. So it's some roughly linear uh, dependence that you see here with some sort of uh, error bars. Uh, if we do the same, we can do the same simulation at the uh, mesoscale with uh, trying to find the right gamma that matches these results, right? So this is the mesoscale type of simulation. We are dragging the uh, DEM represented tube on top of uh, this other one that you see here. Uh, if there is no, uh, this dissipation, if gamma is zero, this friction force is zero, uh, what best matches here is uh, this value that you see here. So, uh, and this would be some other value that we would use to mimic maybe some higher friction occurring through that uh, defects or uh, some other features in the, in the system. So we found also this gamma, the dissipation uh, there. So we'll have now a contact element that re uh, describes uh, dissipation as well. Um, so uh, what I want to show you is uh, going maybe directly to, uh, to DM um, um, simulations of a carbon nanotube network. So we are creating this, uh, now this network uh, of carbon nanotubes. So in this case that you see here, uh, we have a mat of uh, carbon nanotube. Uh, dimensions here is maybe one uh, micrometer. Yeah, dimensions actually you have them here. So we have now about 350 tubes. So something that is of course beyond, beyond uh, what one can dream with uh, in the, maybe in the next 50 years with atomistic simulations. Uh, all right, so we have maybe about 100,000 distinct elements interacting by all these three contacts now. Uh, so at the beginning, we don't know how, to, how this structure looks like. So we are just creating a random structure random uh, directions of the structure and we let them uh, hands-free evolve in time to uh, go to a lower energy uh, structures. And uh, this is what we, we obtain. So we obtain uh, essentially similar entangled bucky paper uh, structure, entangled carbon nanotube bucky paper structure. So tubes are uh, bundling as you see here, so initially they were not bundled, so they were just in different random directions. Now they are bundling due to the van der Waals forces. They are uh, sliding smoothly. 
to arrange to a lower energy state. Uh, some pores are forming, uh, as you uh, see here. Uh, this is a picture of the energy versus time. So the time here is about uh, 8 nanoseconds. So this is the bending energy in the structure. So at the beginning, there is no bending energy, right? The tubes were straight. Tubes are bending, uh, like in the Bucky paper. Uh, Van der Waals energy is uh, lower as well. Structure is uh, stabilized, but it's still slowly evolving in time. Okay, so this is actually not a stable structure. That's something that it took us some time to understand. Uh, so it essentially evolves in time slowly, perhaps to some uh, lower energy structure where maybe all tubes are aligned because that's a state with no, no strain, maximum, uh, maximum van der Waals energy, or some other states that we, we talk about uh, there. Um, so uh, this resembles, this, this method of creating the math resembles uh, the experimental observations. Uh, so we are now in good shape. We can probe the stretching of, this, of these structures. Um, and what you see here is uh, how the structure uh, looks like when you are stretching it. So this is the mat at zero strain. We are gr grabbing, uh, gripping some elements on the left and right, and we apply the formation in a velocity controlled uh, way. Uh, what we see is that uh, the structure responds by uh, compression, okay, on a, on a large scale. So there is some uh, decrease here in, in width with a function of time. The tubes, the individual tubes are uh, responding to the applied strain by uh, relaxing, by zipping, so essentially. So by aligning, um, um, so the aligning moment essentially are uh, making the structure align, each individual tubes align along the applied strain uh, directions. Two uh, pores are growing and they become uh, like I-shape, as, as you see here. What is uh, interesting next is that if we keep stretching, this alignment is uh, it's, uh, increasing more and more. Um, and the pores are, are closing, the structure becomes uh, very dense which is uh, very attractive for, for applications. So successfully we simulate a uh, um, uh, situation in which we can engage all the carbon nanotubes in the structure. So we, again, what we have here is van der Waals and uh, friction. Uh, so going forward 150% strain, we have uh, excellent uh, here alignment in, in the structure. Um, these are the stress strain curves that you see here. This is also very interesting. The response, the mechanical response uh, in, in this mapping, it's also interesting. So at the beginning, we have some linear behavior and then a softening. Uh, softening happens when uh, this zipping happens. All right, so we have some more zipping relaxation. So tubes are uh, like this and then they, they, they start to zip. Uh, but then we have a regime uh, a hardening regime occurring around 30%, uh, which seemed very uh, unusual. Uh, what happens is that uh, we, can, we could relate this with some structures of the, of the tubes that are in the system. So tubes are wavy, okay? And uh, maybe during this regime, we are removing this waviness of the tube. So we are now starting to probe tubes that were previously wavy, okay? And uh, they are uh, here and there entangled at the ends in some different portions. Like for example, these are some tubes that show this uh, waviness removal after 75% uh, strain. So uh, they are entangled because uh, here are essentially pores, these larger pores. Uh, red he uh, color here means uh, bending moment. So red is the maximum bending moment in the structure. So they are entangled around this pore, remember there's also this compression that favors uh, entanglement. Uh, so you can see that essentially in this hardening effect, stretching, it's stretching of the individual tubes, it's, it's favorable. Bending also uh, happens because uh, the pores are, are compressed and the van der Waals energy is increasing because alignment, massive alignment uh, happens. So this is a very interesting 
uh, regime uh, for, for experimentalists, for people that are trying to make, uh, uh, essentially to process this random carbon nanotube map into an aligned uh, type of uh, carbon nanotube uh, system that could be used as a platform for developing composite uh, applications, composite, composite materials applications. So this is, um, uh, how long it is uh, still? Uh, Okay, great, great. So this is uh, um, a comparison of two simulations showing the role of uh, friction. So this dissipation effect that we have added, is that important or not? So this stickiness that is due to friction. Uh, what we find is that it's playing indeed a, an important uh, role. So uh, this is a simulation of a stretching of a nanotube ribbon. So uh, this is two micrometers here, uh, each tube uh, predominantly along this direction could be about one uh, micrometer in, in length. Um, yes, so we are stretching this structure by the same way. Uh, and uh, what happens is that really uh, we are just pulling out tubes out of the mat. There is no really strain, uh, load transfer going on through the structure. So this is when we don't have the friction. We have the van der Waals adhesion. Uh, that's not uh, sufficient to, to, to capture this, this effect, this zipping, uh, direct zipping relaxation of the structure. When we add friction at the level, at least at the level of molecular dynamics, uh, now uh, the, the formation is very different. Uh, is this, I think it's working, right? This was already 30% stretch, so uh, at the beginning, right? So it's already, that's why this, you have this uh, decrease in width here. So the structure now, uh, uh, all tubes are engaged and you have this zipping relaxation that the alignment is increasing along the strain direction and uh, we are densifying uh, the structure uh, due to this effect. Increasing the, increasing the viscous friction helps, okay? So this suggests that maybe adding a polymer material there to increase, to kind of like lubric, lubricate the, 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 the formation, uh, lubricate the, the, the structure would lead to even better type of uh, um, alignment. Uh, and uh, what I wanted to show uh, is that this indeed corresponds to what people see in, in experiment. Uh, so these are some uh, experiments at, uh, that are going on at the Florida State University. So they are purchasing these mats of entangled carbon nanotubes and they are stretching them under large deformations. They form this tape type of structure as we, we did there. And uh, what we see is that indeed these tubes are aligned, per not perhaps not as aligned to, as we uh, have them in the simulations, but the mechanism is, is, uh, is there. So what helps alignment? Uh, viscous friction, it's, it's a key element uh, here. This hardening, uh, and, and in essence, everything that helps the lot, in, in increases the lot transfer, uh, helps alignment. In, in the structure. So uh, here, the fact that we have this waviness removal, so if we have tubes that are beyond some certain length and we are removing this waviness and benefit from this entanglement, uh, that also helps, uh, helps uh, increase the load uh, transfer and then essentially direct this zipping relaxation along the apply strain directions. So if we uh, do not have, um, if we do not have this zipping relaxation, if we not have this apply low transfer, uh, this is really not happening. That's what this, uh, sim these simulations are showing here. So uh, here are some simulations, again, of uh, maybe a smaller carbon nanotube mat in which we are adding uh, artificially some hooked uh, tubes, okay? So they are uh, maybe like uh, 10 pairs of hooked uh, tubes here. So uh, uh, this hooking, uh, it's, it's an entanglement uh, that we are adding in the, in the system artificially. 
uh, just to kind of see, okay, what happens? Is this a key aspect or not? Uh, What's, what we see is that, okay, we are evolving the system in time with this hook system and uh, we are stretching, okay, again, we are pulling out tubes, uh, but uh, the network does whatever it wants, right? So it's, there's not really load transfer. Uh, these hooks are kind of evolving wherever they want. Uh, we have uh, bundling, we have poor, larger poor growth, uh, but there is no this densification which is uh, very attractive and uh, this densification happens only when we have the, the friction uh, in the system. Hooks are good. I mean, they are actually carrying load, as we see in the simulation. So the colors, again, are marking the, uh, the magnitude of the force in the parallel uh, bonds that you see here. Um, so this is the energy versus strain uh, for a structure with hooks and without hooks. So you see the energy, the, the strain energy is, is larger in that, uh, in that case. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so it's, uh, it's, it's a linear, yeah, it's a linear, yeah. Yes, we are changing the, the viscosity. And I, um, atomistic simulations show that at the beginning, okay, friction at the mesoscale, so it's very uh, an explore area. So uh, what we see uh, is that at least for the smallest velocity, we have some linear dependence with applied velocity. So that's justifiable to some. Uh, extent. Um, and um, what, what else uh, is important? Um, remember at the beginning I told you that uh, this structure essentially is not stable. So if we let it relax, it will just evolve perhaps towards a cellular structure that is lower in energy. By, and the main mechanism is this zipping relaxation, right? So uh, we also probe like a later type of structure, uh, having larger pore and more bundling. It's more difficult to align in this case because the structure, once the structure kind of aligns as it wants, uh, it's very difficult to, to make it back uh, into a yarn that would be interesting for, for application. So this is, again, some good clue for, for uh, experimentalists. So um, I will maybe stop here because it's already uh, 11. Um, so this is just a summary of, of the talk. Uh, so uh, mechanics of individual tubes is something that one needs atomistic simulations to understand, but really to benefit from this uh, strength and mechanical properties of tubes and uh, have a method to design uh, how the tubes are interacting with each other for um, developing uh, composite materials, one needs um, at least a mesoscale type of understanding. And uh, results that we obtained uh, recently showed that the mesoscopic distinct element could be that missing uh, method for uh, understanding the mesoscale mechanics of uh, uh, carbon nanotube uh, uh, mats. Uh, and the method hopefully can be further used to uh, to uh, make it more complex, to capture maybe the nanoparticles that are also present in the structure. So these are, when the tubes are grown, they are uh, catalyst-based growth. So they have iron particles there that are present. So they might also play an important role in the load transfer uh, polymer, seeing how uh, friction is enhanced due to the uh, presence of uh, polymer. So uh, with, with this, I thank you very much, and I uh, uh, welcome any questions. <laughs> thank you very much. OK, we have first question already. So. Hi, really nice talk, very interesting. Thanks a lot. Um, I am particularly interested in the parameterization of what here you call mesoscale friction, and um, if I understand correctly, that's the mesoscale rate-based friction. Is that right? It's a dynamic uh, friction. Uh huh. Right. Okay. So yeah. So it's like a it's like a viscous sliding between the nanotubes, right? Right. Could would you mind going back to the slide where you show how you obtained the parameter? So you had like you had the slide where you said, okay, this is what it would be if it was only van der Waals. And this is what we found it to be. And um, I was curious how you derived that. Oh, th this is uh, right. relatively simple. So mm -hmm. uh, 
Right, so, so these are the true atomistic simulations, right? So um, this is just uh, classical molecular dynamics. There mm -hmm. is van der Waals uh, interaction between uh, each uh, carbon atoms. Mm -hmm. So just in the direction of the vector from one atom to the next. So no, no true like tangential friction that you might see in the distinct element method, right? But just, so, uh, yeah, they're, they're all sort of bound together and then you slide two of them past and there's kind of a Van der Waals force between them, and that's it. Uh, all right. So, so, th so this is the this is the atomistic representation, and then we are sliding this tube. Essentially, we are just dragging this ring of atoms, uh -huh. and uh, these other atoms are just evolve F equal M A, uh, however uh, they want. Mm -hmm. uh, the whole energy here, uh, it is a little bit more complex because they are heating up. The tubes are heating up. So we have to take out some uh, temperature. We have to maintain the temperature so we take out some, some of the kinetic uh, energy, random kinetic energy here. So it's not as, it's not as mm. uh, So it's easy. not like you reduce the time to the extent so that you don't get the atoms hitting. You actually do something, you do a little bit more um, uh, numerical manipulation from that or? Uh, so, uh, um, it is rather standard to this process, so it's just coupling the dynamics to a thermostat that takes energy, uh, uh, kinetic energy, uh, random kinetic energy out of the, out of the system. Uh, I have to say that, okay, for this case is not as critical, so we could do also, the heating is not as much, but uh, we also are interested in uh, collapsed carbon nanotubes uh, because those are also interesting for, for applications. So these tubes are, uh, now no longer cylindrical, there is van der Waals attraction. They are large diameter and then van der Waals uh, plays even a major, uh, m a bigger role and then uh, the shape is no longer cylindrical, okay? So now they look like uh, flat tapes here of uh, nanometer, tens of nanometer width, okay? And here the friction, it's, it's orders of magnitude larger and uh, it's heating up, the structure heats up significantly, so we have to take out uh, kinetic energy in, s in order to, to obtain the friction force at a s as, a, as, a friction of, uh, as a function of, uh, at the constant temperature, because um, we have some data here showing how the friction force depends on temperature. So I as you increase the temperature, uh, friction force decreases. And that's this dynamic friction force. It's a dynamic think. friction. So everything here is it's a dynamic friction. The static friction, it, it's, it's relatively small in this case. So it's like there's the viscosity is changing with temperature, if you're right. going to call it fun. Okay, right. thank you so much. Yeah, uh, and of course there is all this phononic uh, friction interpretation uh, mm -hmm. uh, behind that. Uh, I, I didn't have time to, to Just to a cover. second, yes. I want to wait here. Um, your Bucky paper, you did random orientation to start that off in your simulation. What happens if you had some sort of favored orientation and then start straining it relative to that favored orientation? How does the, the Bucky paper property change? Yes, that, that's a question that we're actually uh, looking right now because um, experimental is really what they, they like is uh, it's essentially this densification. Uh, so this densification, it, it's a big deal. And uh, they asked me exactly this question that you ask. And I, I mean, really, it's complex. I, I, we have to do simulations uh, for that. I would say that it's better, uh, but uh, I'm not 100% sure about that. Uh, so we are, exploring, uh, we are exploring this. So there are uh, significant factors here that are impacting the alignment. Uh, tube length, it's one. Tube diameter, it's one uh, degree of alignment, entanglement. So we don't really have a clear understanding how these parameters are playing. Basically, high throughput simulations are needed uh, at this point. Any other tools to explore? Yeah, and we, we have uh, six computers, to <laughs> six licenses to mm -hmm. use that, yeah. Just a, a question about the, the same thing that Kimberly asked. So Essentially, you're getting a macroscopic friction between the two things that's arising because of the van der Waals interaction, not because of two surfaces that are no. pressing against each, correct? No. And then you're getting that effect in your model by putting a dash pot in the contact between those two. And then you chose the dash pot viscosity to match right. the actual atomistic simulations, because I assume people can't do atomic force microscopes and 
measure that. So they, you have to rely upon a more fundamental level model to try yes. to calibrate this model. Is that correct? Is is correct? Yeah. Okay. So so basically that's, that's cool. uh, uh, the final step in our calibration. Uh, where was it? Uh, the final step in our in our calibration to to have that, and. Uh, Essentially, uh, um, yeah, right here. So essentially, one can uh, repeat these uh, atomistic simulations with maybe polymer in between, uh, different types of polymers. And uh, really, it, the nice part is that all you, uh, you you can encapsulate this effect into this gamma, uh, into this gamma. Okay, so that's sufficient. So uh, it, you really can go to the next scale. Yeah. <laughs> okay. One more question, maybe. In your first uh, elongation curve, uh, which is kind of strange, you explained that you have increase in stiffness because of the alignment of the nanotubes. <coughs> but the original stiffness was even higher where they were very unaligned. So that had to be something in addition to that. If you look at the curve, original stiffness is higher than the one after this dip. No, not here, on the left. Right. Like here? Yes. You, you, okay, so this one? Yes. The slope here? Yes. Um, so it is, maybe it's a combination of the, of the cross-section area that is decreasing combined with alignment and with... Okay, so, so this is the engineering stress. Uh, that, that's... Uh, yeah. So, so uh, the cross-section changes. Right. Uh, but the effect is, is, is there. So but perhaps uh, it would have been maybe you can think of this as force because, right, so more like a force thing. Uh, and, and then force is it, still increasing. So what I'm trying to say that it's probably much more complex than just alignment, that there is, there is something else going on. And in fact, even the Van der, Waals, Van der Waals, um, interactions can be acting against the load too originally. So I, I mean, my 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 understanding is that okay. At the beginning, we also have entanglement that we are probing. Mm -hmm. So okay. the fact that the slope is larger uh, benefits uh, it reflects this entanglement. Uh, now, I mean, I, I was also surprised by this uh, fact, and but experimentalists actually see this uh, hardening as okay. well, uh, and that's our interpretation. So we are removing this because um, actually. I have to mention that if the tubes are shorter, we do not see this hardening. So there is a this is a threshold effect. Uh, and one more comment. I understand the value of this kind of analysis, but real materials <laughs> matrix in addition to carbon nanotubes. And carbon nanotubes have a very tiny per percentage from what I read about it. Uh, you know, 2% by weight or 3% by weight. So the, the matrix is going to play a very significant role also in this kind of behavior of the carbon nanotube materials. Yeah, so, so this was essentially NASA's approach uh, that did not work. Uh, essentially matrix and then trying to add carbon nanotubes. But now the, the idea is reversed. So the carbon nanotubes are the matrix. And then the polymer are the filler. So we. Uh, and this really happens b because now it's possible to produce uh, these mats on the industrial scale, enough to, to develop uh, um, uh, materials for, for industry. So you are right, it's just like a different philosophy. Uh, and th that's why they are so interested, in fact, in, in the mechanics of the, the carbon uh, mats, yeah. Okay, as I said, Dimitrika is our next door neighbor, so you all have opportunity <laughs> to <laughs> ask him more questions. And for now, please join me in thanking him for an interesting presentation.